Hi guys, um, welcome to our podcast today. It's an installer from the regional area from Coffs Harbour and we say the higher north you go, the better bang for buck for your solar and uh, Jeff Torzio from Better Vault is with us today and Jeff, we have actually a bit of a ritual here and to mm. get the good vibes going, yeah. you have to touch my ball. Yeah, that one. Oh, this thing, right. <laughs> yeah. Does it move? Can you see the vibe? Oh, the plasma's working, sort of. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it must yeah, be on a, on, a, on a low voltage there. <laughs> You've been in solar, what, uh, 13 years? Is oh, that the lucky number? I think I, I built a camper trailer and travelled around Australia about 15 years ago. Um, so, yeah, I lived with solar first with a hobby system. And actually, I remember reading um, Colin Rivers' book, uh, Caravan Solar RV Solar or something like right, that. Right, right, right. Um, really early days, really, really early stuff where panels were, you know, 15 times the price they are now. Yeah, $1,500 a panel. Yeah. And you weren't just using Sikaflex to stick it to your van, were you? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I actually built a whole camper trailer from scratch, the whole and, thing. And that's how yeah. you fell in love with solar, did yep. you? Yeah. Yeah, okay. it was the uh, start of a beautiful, beautiful journey. So you're in the Coffs Harbour area. Are you guys known for the big banana, is it? Or yeah, yeah. Look, I I, I live up in the mountains, just behind, mm. um, in a little town called Dorigo, about a thousand people. Uh, I do a lot of work in Dorigo, Bellingen, down the hill. It's the like the Mullumbimby of the mid north coast, and then um, and then Coffs. You know, a lot of a lot of work in Coffs because it's a much bigger town. It's a gorgeous place in the area. So yeah, I'm very lucky, very lucky to be living there. So what type mm. of people you got there? Are they hardworking? Do they do uh, mining? Are they baby boomers retiring? Yeah, what do you got? More retirees. You've got tree changers and sea mm. changers. Mm. You definitely have some younger families. And uh, I'm a scout leader of 22 years. I've been uh, Ventura Scouts, which is the 14 to 17 mm. age group. Mm. Um, so I've been doing that for a long time and I'm the Bellingen Ventura leader at the moment. Um, so there are young families, but we do have a pretty aged demographic. I think the... I think the average age on the census a few years back was 57 in Dorigo, so quite aged. So a uh, bit of a retirement area of the North Coast there, but, um, you know, halfway between Sydney and Brisbane. So I think a lot of people want to be in the thick of it. They're down in Sydney or up in Brisbane. So, uh, yeah, it's it's beautiful that we have lovely rainforest, one of the highest rainfalls in Australia. Oh, wow, wow. Certainly in New South Wales. Clean solar panels. Yeah, yeah, just got to make sure you get enough angle and the rain does Bank. it for you. Now, what services do you actually offer in that whole solar range game? Sure. Solar and batteries. Um, obviously, we do sell a few EV chargers these days. Um, I am the recent owner of a brand new uh, BYD Seal full electric car, which has been great for the last few months. Um, but really, solar on its own, ready for a battery mm. or solar with a battery. And we, we tend to sell two types of systems. There's your hybrids, your solar and battery on home, on the grid, and then we've got off-grid, but also in the middle there's a there's a grid support hybrid, which is um, a really powerful and robust system that can handle big surges of power to support a weak grid connection. So instead of spending sixty, eighty thousand dollars upgrading the grid and giving that money to Essential Energy for their assets, we can do a specialized system that gives them a whole lot more grunt. So if they do that renovation on the house, they can give themselves an extra 40 to 60 amps on top of their existing grid connection and not have to pay the upgrade and also get blackout protection, bill reduction and everything else. So with other words, you've got a lot of homes that do do a bit of renovation and then when they realise that they have lifted the comfort level in the home, mm. they've also added two more appliances, et cetera, yeah. a bigger air con, whatever, and then suddenly their grid connection is fizzling out and then they go to yeah, yeah. the local energy retailer. The electrician literally says you can't run the house on that grid connection. You must talk to a level one electrician. But I've got about you know a dozen builders who work with me and they refer a lot of people to me. Um, and the level one electricians go, well, look, this guy, we tried to sell him a $60,000 upgrade for the grid and uh, and he didn't want to do it. He'd so get all curly on to us. Me. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then you have a better solution. Well, I mean, when you can give them something for, you know, thirty or $40,000, um, that then also gives them blackout protection and also nails 80 to 90% of their bill and they're not giving away their money to essential energy. I think uh, most people like that for <laughs> funny, funnily enough, uh, for it's, strange reasons. It's a cough special. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, look, we, we do a bit of off-grid, of course, as well. And being fringe of grid, 
So, you know, Dorigo, Bellingen, Kalang, Darkwood, all these areas are really on the fringe of the network. So we have to deal with things like voltage issues and storm issues. So we get blackouts from trees falling on power lines. People lose the whole fridge two days before Christmas. It can be a real burden on the family and they're willing to spend that bit more money on the battery mm -hmm. to give them blackout protection. So let's say off-grid. You do off-grid systems? Yeah, absolutely. What's yeah. a typical off-grid customer? Is it somebody who found a block in no one's land, build a house on it, and then when they connect, they get a huge bill and they go, yeah. oh, my God, i got to do something else? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, if it's running any more than, you know, 300 meters, you're starting to pay a fair bit for the, the connection. And if mm. there's no space on a transformer, you're immediately up for twenty to $40,000 for just the transformer. So to add an off-grid system, you know, it's it's cheaper up front and then the ongoing costs are lower too. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Um, one thing with an off-grid system that I think a lot of people skip out on and forget is a good quality generator. Now, I don't sell generators. Trust me, you want to get a good quality generator. It's like a Kubota or a Caterpillar, a diesel, even a Honda petrol, but just the cheaper generators cause the issues the most with, um, with off-grid systems. 95% of all off-grid systems problems are generators. So really what you're saying is you get a big solar system to start off with, you get a decent battery that is sized correctly, so you're not kind of undersizing and trying to be cheap initially and then pay the price. But it's always smart to still have a generator there for yes. the five, six, eight days that you get rain and Spot your on. solar is slowed down yeah. and you don't want to just sit there on one LED light and nothing else <laughs> is on, is it? Even with really big solar arrays, you're still lucky to run fridge lights, computer routers, and, and basic things, um, and certainly pressure pumps. If you're if you're off grid, properly off grid, you're mm. going to have tanks with pressure pumps for domestic water service. So yeah, so a, a generator is an integral part of any off grid system. It, it's in the the Clean Energy Council accreditations. All say you know three to five days of battery autonomy, but then generator in integration. Um, and getting a good quality automated generator mm. just takes all the hassle out of it. You just keep it serviced and full of fuel and put it somewhere it doesn't annoy you. And then it is your backup. And yeah, and you're sitting just like you're on the grid. And I've designed systems that are a hundred and it was about a hundred and thirty thousand dollar system I did for a, a gentleman who had a very large house on a hill up near Byron Bay, and he had a Porsche Taycan full electric. And so he wanted to be able to charge that baby three phase fast <laughs> and hard and he bought a huge system. And, yeah, you can do that. But most people, they've got the grid. And I do get a lot of people call me up and say, Jeff, I want to go off grid. Oh, well, hold, hold on, hold on. I can understand the sentiment but a hybrid system where you're on the grid and you've got solar and batteries is the best thing. And trust me, I, I have a financial reason to say otherwise, so listen to me when I say this. Stay on the grid. What you want to do is play with the grid. You want to keep your costs as low as possible, but when it is cloudy, you need a cheap way of getting energy and you can't beat the grid. Generators are much more expensive. So, yeah, hybrid's the way to go. Okay, I get that, but... Um I mean, why wouldn't you try and flog them the whole off-grid and make a bit more money? Because I'd much rather them have a repeat business from their friends or family when they say Jeff really gives good advice. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Small towns, we look after each other. You know, I, I have a wide range of friends and family and networks beyond those, mm. and we all look after the whole community and we all talk about what we do and how we do it. It's a bit different to the city. So if you don't want to just go back in your caravan and go to the next town and scout your wares, <laughs> you actually got to do good business Absolutely. In, and in the good local products. area. Good mm. products, good service. Mm. So better service, better installation mm. and, and better quality products. That's what we do. So when you talk about products, especially for off-grid, where you really become the power station of, of the people and even for anybody who wants to get a solar system, I mean, mm. they're very, very cheap solar systems about. Usually the stuff looks okay from about 20 metres. You get a bit <laughs> closer, you realise what you bought. But what's your opinion on solar? Working on in the industry for 15 years now, I've, I've seen – I've seen a lot of brands come and go and saving that extra 20%, 30% does not make sense in the end. You do buy twice. You do have to deal with problems and the solar companies that do that don't stick around typically. So I, I, I would always hazard getting it right the first time, paying a little more, but knowing you've got the service and support if you need it, but really good quality, you really do need it. So. 
But yeah. those uh, cheap solar company give me 10 year workmanship warranty yeah. and 25 year panel warranty. Yeah, yeah. It sounds I'm, all good on paper. I'm sure they'll, you know, if you really had to go through courts and try and chase them <laughs> through the ombudsman or the ACCC or something, you, you might get something. But really, a lot of them cut and run. I mean, you only have to look at, mm, I probably can't say. Don't say certain their name, names, but, uh, but there are certain companies that have phoenixed. You know, they have started off under one name, and then four years later, they're no longer around, and and they are some of the largest installers in the country. So you're saying Solar Shine becomes Solar Shinier, and they're out of the same premises, <laughs> and the trucks look very similar, and the people you are all almost the same. said it, <laughs> but yeah. It's 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 time and again it's happened over and over and over and yet people still fall for it, which is a shame, because in the end we need a sustainable energy industry. That that works both ways, mm. you know. You need to have a sustainable sustainable energy industry, and we're sadly not doing it. Even the Clean Energy Council, who's no longer the accredited um, governance body, uh, it's just changed this month. Um, they said 30% of all solar systems in the in the country are substandard or dangerous, mm. 30%. Mm. That's that's not a good track record. So, you know, we don't want to give the uh, certain sections of our political organisations or media any more firepower for, uh, for their anti-renewables campaigns and we have to be careful about what we do and how we do it because in the end you pay less when you get good quality installed by someone who cares and that's the key thing. So do you think it's more the good quality gear or getting an installer who cares that actually matters how the system ends up? Well, the second thing, you still need someone to be around if you ever want to add a battery mm. or add an EV charger, mm. you know, someone who can say to your friend who's building that house on that hill where there isn't any grid or there is a weak grid connection, hey, do you know someone who can help me with this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This guy knows his stuff. He's an accredited designer. So... Yeah, that's another thing that bugs me a bit about my industry. I've noticed so few salespeople, so mm. people designing your solar system, so few of them actually have an accreditation. So, so they, meaning the solar guy sells you whatever he feels you can get away with and then the installer comes onto site and ha and finds out that half of it was just uh, Grimm's uh, fairy tale story and he has to make it fit. Yeah, and usually they've got a budget to fit because... <laughs> they've sold you that system. And so if they've sold you a system at a budget and then they get there and find that things don't quite work, they just have to get it done as best they can to get away and get to the next job the next day. And that's a terrible way to run a business. If you've got people stepping onto site that have the products and the bits and, and an expectation about a certain format and layout and the cabling that runs into the grid and all these things, and then it doesn't meet that, they're not going to fix it all for you for free. They're going to do the best they can. Well, we all I've know seen what that means. the puzzle pieces that get picked together like that, where if it doesn't fit, you just start getting the hammer and pit, fit that piece into the square, even if it wasn't designed for that. The amount of times I've seen it on people's roofs when they do a, a renovation or an upgrade or something and I go, that's not even the standard, that's dangerous, <laughs> like it's just not right. So, yeah, do it right. Get an accredited designer. Ask for their, I was going to say CEC number. It's no longer the CEC. Mm. There's now a new accreditation body. But ask for their accreditation number. And mm. if they don't have one, Go somewhere else. So you don't believe the philosophy of silicon fixes everything applies? Mm. Silicon seals pretty well. That's about it. Um, <laughs> I've seen like, panels stuck to the roof with silicon. <laughs> yeah, I, I have too. <laughs> um, or, you know, tile roofs with drilled through the tile with a bit of silicon around it. Oh, that's shocking. Um, but the customer wouldn't know. Well, that's right. Only Until, when it starts dripping from the ceiling. Yeah, and that may take <laughs> six years because it takes a while for the silicon to degrade and mm. then the workmanship warrant is no longer in place and all those things. And the company's not around. Yeah. Another thing that I have to deal with in my local area is volt rise. Oh. So as we all progress towards a renewable future, which is obvious because of the cost, we are less than half the cost of coal, far less than gas and obscenely cheap compared to nuclear. So we're all going towards solar and wind and then how we store that energy, whether it be through hydro or batteries, and we, we buffer the, the, you know, the duck's back is, is, is broken now, mm. but we've still got these peaks where the duck's head and the duck's tail are. What we're really talking about bit. is 
the renewables, sometimes there's a lot of it generated and we need to store it at certain times. That's yeah. what, It's known as the duck curve and all that. So that's yeah, what you're yeah, talking yeah. about for people who are wondering why we're going into yeah. Chinese quack, cuisine. Quack. Uh, <laughs> so, so in the end, we all need to store and play with energy on the mm. grid. Mm. Um, and the more decentralized we make it, the more robust it is, mm. the more insulated against you know, blackouts from from storms and trees falling over or major power line transmission lines down in Victoria mm. that just happened recently. Um, as we go through this transition, the grid is getting a bit more not unstable in the respect that it's it's supply and demand. I would say it's like an orchestra where you have quite a lot of instrument. In, in, initially, mm. the grid was maybe just a big trombone. The, the coal fire power station. Yeah. But now you're getting all these different little instruments coming in and the challenge is to give it all still in harmony. Yes, yes. We have to maintain frequency. Mm. We have to maintain voltage. And voltage is a real issue. So coming back to voltage rise. Mm. So when you're on the fringe of grid, when you're in the country areas like me, um, when people go and try and get you as much export into the grid as possible, or even worse, don't apply correctly when they go to essential energy to say, hey, I've got this system and these are the cables running into the grid. If they do that wrong, if they lie and go, oh, yeah, we got you more export, you can literally raise the voltage too high in your house and blow up appliances. I had a customer who we did an upgrade for and the previous solar company had very large solar company. Um, it's two words and one is to make... No, 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 no we're not I... going there. <laughs> <laughs> there was a company they... that was a competitor and yes. they did something and now please They explain. saved $250 worth mm -hmm. of cabling and they literally raised the voltage so high in the person's house that they were the inverter then started shutting down because they have high voltage limits mm. in the inverter mm. to protect. Um, when they rang that solar company, that company gave them the override codes. <laughs> yeah, and opened up the <laughs> upper voltage limit override codes. That's like a fuse box and I put a nail in it now. <laughs> yeah, and, and so he'd literally blown up a fridge, I think it was. No, it was a washing machine. It was a washing machine and he was like, yeah, I wonder why everything was going wrong in the house. It's like, well, for literally $250 worth of cabling, they should have just put in the right cable to start with. So we just, we fixed that cabling up for him. And when I rang Essential Energy and spoke to the engineers in the department where the applications are done, they looked back at the application. They blatantly lied about the length. It was four metres instead of 24 metres worth of four mil square copper. And it's like, wow, this is what we have to compete with. That's what you get for your $3,000 solar systems. You have people just cutting every corner possible because how else are they going to survive at that margin? It's insane. So, yeah, so voltage rise is a real issue. Um, as we all progress towards this future and we're doing the right thing by putting renewables into the grid, we need to also maintain the voltage within certain parameters. And it's in the standards and they should all do it. So I think that we need to really clamp down on that sort of behavior more and more. Mm. So if you get to a customer now, everybody's inquiring about batteries too. What do you say to people, get a solar system only and wait for the battery or get a solar and battery now? Are we ready for it? What's your opinion? So I've said, I've said pretty much that for the last eight, nine years now. A lot of people are saying, oh, I want to get a battery. And look, okay, why do you want to get a battery? If people say it's for financial reasons, I shut them down pretty quickly. I say, hold on. When you take the price of the battery and you say how many kilowatt hours you can cycle in and out of that battery over its warranted lifespan and divide it up, it's about 26 cents a kilowatt hour. So what's your buy price? 33 cents. What's your sell price? 7 cents. Have you done the maths? It's one for one. So I've been saying that for a very long so time. So basically what you're saying in a short and math thing, a battery won't make you money. It'll break even. But if you do a battery and solar then it will make you money because yes. some of the profit of the solar moves over into the battery. Yes. And then you also got the benefit of having the blackout protection. Exactly. And as I understand in your part of the world, you do get storms and you do get yeah. issues. And that's very nice to be in power when everybody else around you. Absolutely. Uh, the, the blackout protection part is probably what sells most batteries for me. So when someone says I want to do it for financials, they say, look, it's six of one and a half dozen the other, really, until you, there's more earnings. And, and we'll get back to that because there's some exciting things happening right now. Finally, I'm changing my tune. Um, but the blackout protection is the key thing. 
People want that autonomy. It's not just a practical thing. There's something visceral. There's something personal about wanting to take myself away. There's an animosity towards the energy companies and this this fossil fuel dominated, you know, country. Nobody likes the energy company. No, and and no one likes the fact that they are delaying this transition, um, which is clearly and and. You know, you can you can leave behind all the politics and BS. Economically, we can prove that we're going in the right direction. Forgetting environmental belief, economy of scale is taking us to a really good place, and and lowering wholesale prices for everyone. Um, but the interesting part is now where we're going with VPPs. And but, and hey, but hang on, there was my question. Yeah. If I'm the end customer, I'm walked in. Am I going to get solar or solar in a battery? You haven't actually answered that question. It depends. And you said you've changed your tune. So I have what's been. the story? Is it worth now? It's getting really good. So I only use Fronius inverters. I think that they're the best inverters in the world. You know, for environmental, manufacturing quality, they're made in Austria. So for security reasons, there's lots of reasons why people love Fronius. You only have to look online to see that. They're the most popular high premium cost inverter, but they last, and they're really good. I've been working with them and their batteries, the, the BYD battery. They only chose one battery to start off with. And I don't think they've integrated the other battery. They were talking about LG, but thank God they didn't go down that path. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Just with the recall and everything that occurred and the battery fires, I, I never liked that chemistry of cell. Anyway, um, when you get a, a battery and inverter combination, the solar is doing most of the heavy lifting, which means you can get a return on investment inside the warranty period. No problem. Um, the blackout protection is just a bonus then. Where the third thing is, and, and trading of energy, and we won't say VPP because as Amber Energies call it, their smart shift technology is about focusing the algorithm and the features of the product on the customer, not on the earnings of the energy company running the VPP. So if you go and join one of these other, I think there's like 24 VPPs in the market right now. There's heaps of them. Um, they're centered around profit making for the energy company. So they are getting you to play with your battery that you spent a fair bit of money on, and they're looking to make money and give you scraps from the table. And I'm talking 10, 20% of the value of what they are earning from your battery. And they're cycling it harder sometimes to do so as well. So it's really not worth it if you're just going to go for a standard VPP. Whereas Amber Energy have got this um, smart shift and that is a subscription model where they give you wholesale pricing. So to give you an idea, last Thursday up in Essential Energy in my area, um, from at 5.42 p.m. it was $17.64 a kilowatt hour. Wow. So and, that's, and that's the kilowatt hour that sold at 32 cents. That's the wholesale cents. price. Now, okay. most people are insulated from this by their mm -hmm. retailer mm -hmm. because they've got, you know, a flat fee of 33 or 35 cents a kilowatt hour for the whole year. There you go. There's your contract. Now, technically, I've seen that down as low as 12 and 16 cents and 20-something cents. Mm -hmm. But then occasionally there are these huge spikes. And this is why the little retailers that we all had so much, you know, faith that they were going to take us to a, a, a better future, why a number of them went to the wall a few years back is because of these huge price spikes. Now, if you look at WA, they only had a 3% price hike last year. The whole of the Eastern Seaboard, which is part of the national electricity market, poor Northern Territory and WA, we just leave them off. Um, <laughs> we don't have a domestic gas reserve. They do. We are filling the gaps right now that will in the future be filled by batteries. We are filling those gaps with gas. And due to the Ukraine war and the international gas price on the Eastern Seaboard, we got a 30% price hike last year. But now the wholesale price has already come down. Yes. But the AGLs and origins of this world They're are not making it on. <laughs> record profit. And yeah. we're all suffering a cost of living crisis. Yeah. And those large energy retailers are sitting there rubbing their hands yeah. and none of the politicians actually kicking them backside and say, pass those savings on right now. Yeah, yeah, because in the end, it's an open market. You know, we, we want to live in a society that's got a free market, and yet sometimes it really doesn't work in the public's best interests. You know, free market economies help billionaires, really. <laughs> they don't help the average man. 
Let's face it. The Elon Musks and the Jeff Bezoses of this world really benefit and they'll smash unions and they'll do everything they can to make more money for us, we would like more of a, hmm, let's call it a socialist democratic sort of society because we want some control on these behemoths. Well, we don't really get that unless we start to play in other ways. So let's but, say I've but, got but a battery. I mean, is there one way to get out of it by mm. becoming very autonomous on your electricity, get a solar and battery system yeah. and basically give them all the... Well, 99% of finger. We still need them a little bit. And that's why I think staying connected to the grid is so important. But you need to play. So having a battery and trading energy and, and $17.64 a kilowatt hour, well, what's stopping you from forecasting that? Well, there are forecast mechanisms and that's what Amber uses to predict when to hold on to energy or even buy energy when it's cheap mm. and then sell it when it's expensive. Um, they can make Good money. Now, I've done some back-of-envelope calculations and the new Fronius and BYD systems we're doing, which we are trialling. We're beta testing the software right now as we speak. Mm -hmm. This week is the start of that. So within a few months, we should have a product available to market, which will allow for trading of energy. An average 11 kilowatt hour battery that I'm selling these days should earn twelve to $1,400 a year more. Couple that with another revenue stream coming for batteries, which is the PDRS, the Demand Reduction Scheme. The New South Wales government is releasing another revenue stream, hopefully April 1st onwards. We're very, very short time away now from maybe seeing another seven or $800 a year more. So if you can earn $2,000 a year more out of your battery, but you've spent $13,000 on that battery, then suddenly the return on investment is coming back down to where solar is. So the whole system is paying for itself in four and a half years. Well, I'd say actually it's possibly going to the period that solar took off because I remember in the early days mm. when the solar payback came from 15 years of crazy numbers like that to the six to seven year period, that's when people start saying, okay, if it lasts 10, 15, 20, I'm kind of doubling my money, it's worth it. But what people have to consider, if a battery pays itself back in seven years, your solar pays itself back in four years. You're doubling mm. them up together. You are sitting at five-year payback, and that's actually a reasonable payback on an investment because if you pay 20 grand over the four, uh, 10 years of you know the battery definitely lasting and the solar longer, yeah. you're getting doubling your money. Yeah. It's not yeah. bad return on the current circumstances. Yeah. And some people will always try and push it and go, oh, but for half the price I can get something that's similar. You won't. And that's the, the no, You do get something that will you work. You get something but you put it in land, time. You put it in landfill yeah. in half the time. And the yeah. environmental cost of that kind of stuff is still not being counted, which Absolutely. really annoys the hell out of me. It's got to be sustainable, sustainable yeah. energy yeah. industry. Absolutely. What panels do you recommend and why? I use Jinko. Um, have done a long while in now. We, we've. I have also started adding Waneco to the range, mm. um, just because sometimes people have a bit of a, a, a security issue thought around China, um, which is why also I really love Fronius inverters. They're Austrian. I use Selectronic inverter chargers for off grid, which are the best made here in Melbourne. Eighty three percent built in Melbourne. There's actually an Australian made product. Yeah, built like a tank. So many off-grid people rely on it. I find them it. working 30 years later. No kidding. Mm. We have plenty of communes down in Kalang and Bellingen and things like that. It's amazing. Those little blue boxes are still running. They're incredible. They You cannot beat them for quality. Australian engineering. Yep, yep. They've just expanded their facility in Melbourne too, so we're going to see some better things out of them in the future. But, uh, but yeah, in terms of manufacturing, I always try and keep a wide – a wide range of product in a couple of rands. <laughs> so I pick the best. I pick the I pick the eyes out of the market and make sure it's the stuff that I really trust and support. They support me and I support the customers. So if you have good warranties and you have good support, you know it's going to be fine. The the batteries, man, that's the thing that's been the most amazing for me is watching battery sales rapidly rise. Bit of a dip with the, the economy sputtering a little bit at the moment, but really with the VPP stuff that's coming out now or even the Amber's smart shift stuff, it's really going to take off again now. So we're going to see a, a rapid adoption of those. Then there's electric vehicles as well, and they'll be able to interact with the grid and make money and lower the wholesale price for everybody. That's the future that we're all heading towards. 
Mm. So if I would uh, have you walk into my door uh, and I'm interested in solar <laughs> and a battery, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> into my house, um, what do I expect from you? Are you kind of like a put your foot in the door sales guy and you're only going to leave when you get the signed contract? What, what's the no. kind of? At the end, I literally, they start trying to make a decision. I go, no, 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 talk to your wife. I'm going. There's your contract. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you soon. So, um, yeah, look, it, it's it's different. The, the little country towns, we don't need that sort of pressure sales tactics. It's we, we, we rely on trust. We rely on people talking between each other about the quality of work that they've received um, and they do a bit of research. I really like my clients to do their research, which is why I really like your energy answers because you guys do lots of guides and support material that get people thinking about it. It, we need bite-sized pieces of information to be absorbed on a regular basis, whether that's through handheld device or wherever, just educating people on the little things that make sense. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Right, a battery trading energy and making you know, a couple of thousand dollars a year, mm, that sounds good. Mm. So mm. the more we do that, the more the education of the entire population takes us to another future. You know, it's... I think the whole thing that holds us back, especially in certain circles of society, is just ignorance. Not not nasty ignorance, but just general ignorance. Lazy like ignorance how, how, sometimes. How cheap is solar? Wow. Mm. Solar panels are obscenely cheap. Mm. For something that is a 25-year warrant, how many things can you buy that have a 25-year warranty these days? And we stick these damn things on your roof in the blazing sun. You know, open and exposed to all the elements. Mm, mm. And yet people expect that now. That's good. We should expect good things out of products like that that do last. Um, but something that can save money, save the planet, and take us all towards this electric future. It, 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 we have this wonderful untapped resource in Australia. We're so spoiled. Mm. Mm. What about ignorant customers who thought they got a great solar system and then you did a service and an inspection on it and you had to pop their bubble? Have you had that? Yeah, look, it's, it's awkward. I, I don't like it. I kind of avoid it because, you know, they, <laughs> you don't want to burst people's bubble. Um, it, it never works out. I had anyone. those German solar panels made in China. <laughs> <laughs> All Canadian ones. Um, yeah. <laughs> Look, in the end, there are really good resources if you're ready to go and look for the information to work out what something good quality is. So, for instance, inverters. You, you don't have to look far before you find Fronius and everyone who's anyone will say they are solid, they're the best. Um, but then you look into their environmental credentials and how they're really pushing forward with the technology, like integrating car charges. And, oh, what really. do you mean with the environmental uh, stuff? Is I think they use recycled material yeah. back in the inverters quite, they do. quite they good do. percentages. And they, they aggressively recycle all the stuff they can internally mm. um, using renewable energy to produce the products. The, all the components they try and use are the longest lasting, most robust and, and technically compatible for the future. Mm. So when I add a car charger and I'm putting in, uh, I, I always show people the monitoring. First thing I do, education through images is always better than talk, talk, talk. Mm. Mm. And I can talk too much. Um, so <laughs> I sit down in front of my laptop and I open it and I go, the first thing I want to talk about is how solar looks. And I show them a 24 hour graph mm. of another customer. Mm. And, and yeah, 10% of the time they go, oh, Jill and Frank, yeah, I know them. <laughs> Good old small town. Um, but but I, I show them how solar works and how their loads look. You know, the classic thing I hear is, oh, I just want enough solar to meet my needs. I don't want to export to the grid. I just laugh. I go, you have no idea how it really looks because solar does this lovely bell curve and your loads go all over the shop. And they're spiky, so you're always going to export. It's just a proportion of export. Mm. And, of course, yeah, you don't want to go stupidly big, but a fair bit of export's always a good thing. You can chase fairly decent feed-in tariffs mm. and knock off your nighttime usage and your access fee. Mm. You can chase a 90% reduction on a bill pretty easily. 95, you're pushing it. 98 or 100 is very hard. You need a battery. You definitely need a battery. And you need absorbent exorbitant amounts of solar to really thump it back. Um, and some people say, yeah, great. I've done the calculations and, and I saw a scientist talk about all the energy that we use, all the carbon and everything in a modern Australian Western lifestyle. The average consumption, each person needs 15 kilowatts of solar. 
a day. Yeah, well, 15 kilowatts of solar panels can produce, mm. as you know, mm, mm. 70, 80 kilowatt hours a day. So that's covering everything you do in all your life, whether it be the product that you buy at Woolworths, which has been freighted this far and manufactured in that country over there. So we're saying you need like 70, 80 kilowatt hours a day of total offset for all of our carbon footprint. I think that that can be improved upon. Once you start driving an electric car, then you start really efficiently. And when you look at the cost, life cycle cost carbon-wise as well as uh, dollars on electric vehicles, you'll see that that'll probably lower that by 20, 30 kilowatt hours. Mm. So really, you should be aiming for 10 kilowatts of solar panels per person on your house if you want to really nail it all. Um, But most roofs wouldn't be big enough for that. Yeah, it's a struggle. Uh, I only just squeezed 20 kilowatts on my house for myself and my wife, Mm. and, Mm. yeah, it was a struggle. (laughs) I've got a pretty big roof. Do you get to places where you suddenly look at the consumption, the number of people in the household, and there is actually not enough roof space to put all the solar that it's needed? Yeah. What are your options there? Look, most people don't chase the full, you know, 10 kilowatts per person. Most most people have to do about 7, 8 to 10, 12 kilowatts, depending on the consumption of the household right now. And that's really the the bulk of the savings. That's the 90% saving um, of their electricity bill. Mm. And they feel happy about that. And they're doing a great job if they can do that on their roof. It's funny to think back to a decade ago when I was selling three kilowatt systems and thinking they were quite large. Um, so, so yeah, there, there's, there's enough. There's enough roof space for 90% of people that I'm trying. Sometimes I'm squeezing and I'm going to secondary buildings and running cables through Mm, and mm. and trying to get a little bit more on, but generally it's quite doable, yeah. And that's got enough room for charging electric car too. Um, When I bought my electric car, I did some calculations and they have borne true that I'm running at about 1.6 cents a kilometre. Right. Now, are you now having an electric car in your decent size solar system and I assume a battery, have you gone and been driving literally free, like on your solar? Pretty much. I mean, you can't say for free because you had to build the asset Mm. to produce the energy. Mm. And so when you look at a solar system, for an average solar system, I'm doing like a 7.9 kilowatt system, that's working out over the 25-year lifespan of performance at around seven or six and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Right. So that's the best figure to take. And then say, right, I want to get five and a half kilometers per kilowatt hour. Do the math. You're a little over one and a half cents per kilometer. Then you take into account tires, servicing, which is very, you know, large servicing intervals. You really just need tires, shock absorbers, brake pads, and a very brief Mm. service for (laughs) firmware, software updates, and really things like that. Um, And the whole thing comes to about six, six and a half cents a kilowatt hour, a, a, a kilometer, which is obscenely cheap. You know. So you're saying for, let's round it up a bit, for seven bucks, everything included, you're driving 100K on the EV. Yeah. But if I go and use a car with 10 litres consumption uh, and per 100K and it's nearly two bucks of petrol, so there's $20 That's versus seven bucks. Oh, don't forget also the servicing costs and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, so once you're using an internal combustion engine car, you service costs are way higher. Um, yeah, so effectively you're running at around thirty cents versus six, and that's the cheapest petrol car you can find. And people tra- do complain a lot about sort of electric vehicle charging. Yeah, it's getting better. It's it's not great at the moment. It's certainly coming up at a fast clip now. We've got fast charging facilities for use one to two percent of the time. Everyone has a, a, another bunch of reasons why oh EVs aren't going to work. Well. Plainly, all of those myths are being busted right now. Um, When you can say, I charge 98% at home and I occasionally go on a long trip, and yes, I'll have to pay 60 cents a kilowatt hour to charge it up Mm. on those fast charges, but then I can only stop for half an hour and have a sandwich and go to the bathroom and stuff, then there's really no impact on my lifestyle, maybe an extra 10 minutes. And for 98% of the time, I'm running on 6 cents a kilometre, and that's everything included. So... Batteries last for a long time now. They're much safer. I can crash in my car. It is completely safe. There are other chemistry of batteries I would not 
go and drive around on. I did for eight and a half years, actually. <laughs> I had a Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid. Right, right. Um, and it was a great car. I, I, I liked it. It was just after 280,000 Ks, it was kind of giving up the ghost. The battery had really given up the ghost. And the difference there is plug-in hybrid, you thrash that battery. Every trip, you are fully cycling that battery. Yeah, because it's a very small battery. Exactly. So you're going really hard on, yeah. hard on it. I actually don't think you should be calling them a hybrid because mm. with the petrol and the battery together, not even 10% of the driven distance is going to come from the battery. I yeah. always thought, oh, they must have like a decent sized battery in it. I looked into it and I realized it's a weeny peeny battery well, in, a, in a really big petrol There's hybrids and plug-in hybrids. So if you get a Toyota RAV4 mm. hybrid right mm. now, it's mm. a half kilowatt hour battery. It's tiny. But I had a plug-in hybrid. So it had an 11 kilowatt hour battery. Mm. Oh, no, there was 10, I think, 10 usable. Um, and so that could get me about... 35 to 40 Ks, depending on hills and things like that. But every trip I would do would easily reach 40 kilometers. I would live in the bush. So every trip I was using that battery fully. I drive Flogged 40 it. kilometers on my new electric car. I'm using 80% of, uh, 8% of the battery. Mm, mm. So those batteries are going to do probably over a million kilometers, which just, is actually the full life of the car. Just for people who watch this, a battery if you don't discharge it every time and just give it a little bit of a nudgy and then charge it again, mm. that battery will last many, many, many years longer mm. than the one that you discharge completely every time and then fill it up again. So yeah. if you get a bigger battery and you don't you know, whack it every time, uh, you will get better. It's called a partial life. cycle and 10 partial cycles are like one full cycle. Full you know, 10 10 percent you know, Got it. cycles. <laughs> Now, um, one thing that some people have different opinions on is um, the zero-dollar bill. They're door knockers. They come to your house and they promise you a zero-dollar bill as soon as you go solar. Uh, do they tell the truth? No, it's a, it's a complete furphy and they know it. Um, but it's look, good to sell the system and if you if you get the customer sucked in to believe it <sighs> uh, and, and if you come in – and tell them the truth, and they already got zero dollar bill in their head, and you say, actually, you're probably still going to pay twenty percent. You might never get the job because they think you're lying. Look, nine times out of ten, I can easily show them why that's not true. And, you know, it's it's back of envelope calculations. It's not hard. Um, chasing that last five percent of the bill is really hard. Um, you still got your access fee. You've still got cloudy weather. Even if you've got a battery, if we can trade energy out of a battery and make you know a thousand to two thousand dollars a year more, mm. then great. Yeah, no problems. We'll go into negative bill territory for sure. But for an average solar system, there are. I, I worked for three other solar companies before I started my own, and. The second one that I worked for, I only lasted two and a half weeks because I saw this aggressive, pushy sales tactic stuff they were trying to make me do, and I couldn't stand it. I had to leave. What, you were a bad sales guy talking bullshit? Well, they wanted, they had a <laughs> script. I actually deviated from the script once, and they wanted to reprimand me. Because and you I, told the truth. Because I was telling the truth. <laughs> it's like, whoa. Um, so unfortunately, look, the, every industry has those sorts of sharks, and we did attract them in the, you know, it's like blood in the water. When you when you start giving rebates or, or, or something from a government, mm. whether it be roofing insulation or something else, you're going to attract those sharks. And unfortunately, the sharks never really left the pool um, in our industry. Um, that being said, there's heaps of good little guys. And I even know local guys to me, you know, who I really appreciate there. We go out, we, we talk about, you know, our world and we get, we get along really well. Yes, there are other companies that I'm like, okay, they're okay. And then there's just what about the, people. the ones that fly in like locusts Ooh. from afar and then they give you a special in, well, but, in town But they now. employ local installers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how is after sales with them? Yeah, what what after sales? It's, look, it's buy beware. Every industry has it. I don't go out and look for the absolute cheapest vehicle I can buy. So if you think you're buying a, a, a Toyota and you bought a great wall, what are you going to get? Not the same. No. Got it. Now, how important do you emphasize actually the whole relationship and the after sales? Because just here out, I believe nowadays you buy solar. It's not just solar. It's the whole journey over the next 10 years as the house transitions to electrification. So it's a mm, much more important decision. Definitely. How do you explain that to customers, including <laughs> after sales? How many hours have they got? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I can talk a lot. Um, look, if anyone has a, a gas cooktop, 
and they sticking to gas, I kind of laugh a little bit because cooking with gas is a term that we all got brainwashed by the gas industry back in the 70s and 80s. Um, the truth is cooking with induction is markedly better. It's faster. It uses half the energy. You don't make the handle hot. You don't burn yourself. All those things relate to everything else in your home. Um, solar hot water is a funny one. I still tell people don't worry about solar hot water. If they've got an electric hot water tank, um, we just put a smart solar soaking switch, so a smart relay, um, and that's brilliant. It's a few hundred dollars, and it could diverts energy from a panel up on the roof that's got a 25-year warranty. So solar hot water's moved, and I find now just electric hot water systems with um, smart solar switches do the trick. But in terms of everything else, you know, how you heat and cool your house, obviously electricity is the best. It's so much quicker and cleaner and efficient now. But electric cars... And electrification through a battery certainly takes it to another level. Um, having a smart charger for your electric car mm. is really nice. And this is another reason I always show people the graph. I start off with a standard solar system and you've got the, the spiky line of consumption. You've got the solar production curve. Whatever falls beneath the, product, the, the consumption curve in the solar period is gold. And I go, look, every square there is a kilowatt hour and that's gold because you're saving 35 cents a kilowatt hour. And every unit up here you export, that's seven cents. It's just just a little, good. little stop. Mm. In Sydney now we pay between 45 and 50 in some places. Oh. You guys are still very cheap. Look, it's funny. I still see people above 40 cents in my area, mm. but the better retailers do actually give around the 35 cent mark. Mm. Now, that's another way in which I add on to my systems. And I do tell people straight up, I'm charging you for this. It's $380 I charge to set up this uh, solar analytics software, which Nigel Morris, mm. a, a regular on your show, set up this company. It's a, It's got an algorithm and it sends people to the best retailer plan that suits them, mm. their patterns of buying and selling. And I've looked in the data and little old lady here, Lots of export, not much purchase. She gets sent to this plan because it's got a high feed-in tariff. It's also got a high buy price, but that doesn't matter. The algorithm has worked out. She's going to save an extra $480 a year going over here. Mm. But this family, who's still got big loads during the nighttime, they're sent to another plan with a five-cent feed-in tariff. So using smart algorithms to work out the best market offer for you, brilliant. So thank you, Nigel. Um, but, yeah, the, I guess... As we electrify, and I show those people those graphs at the beginning of their solar journey, we talk about self-consumption, we talk about export, and then I show them an electric car and an electric car with a household battery. And you add all those colours together on the graph and they make full sense to everyone. And they just, they get it. There's no long explanation. They just see the colours and they see the absorption and go, oh, right, so... So when I've got my, my electric car and, and I don't have to rush off anywhere tomorrow and it's got a 400K range and I might go to, you know, 100Ks away, but, you know, that's <laughs> half the battery there and back, fine. Um, I just want to charge it on the cheapest solar possible. So we have the Fronius Watt Pilot, which is the wall charger, and it connects up and puts this lovely other colour into the graph and you just have an app on your phone and you go, okay, just charge on the excess, just charge on the grey stuff that I was only going to get seven cents for. Mm. And that's where you get to that same cost parity of 1.6 cents a kilometre for the energy to drive the vehicle. But the other thing is you need to drive to Sydney tomorrow and the battery's half full and you don't want to wait until the sun's up. You just go on the app, click on a button, take it off eco, and now it's charging at a full clip, seven kilowatts or wow. three phase. That's brilliant. It's simple and it works and anyone can run with it. And if we can provide those bridges across these technological gulfs mm. that people feel like they have now with this technology, then everyone starts adopting it, saving money and feeling good about it. Wow. Now, after sales, solar doesn't have many moving parts. You say use the Fronius. That's a robust inverter. Um, who cares, does it? Well, it's, it's adding on those extra things. It's saying, Jeff, can you help me with that solar analytics software? How do I compare the different market offers mm. and choose? And, and go and change retailer. Um, you know. What about maintenance? Oh, I do recommend we wash panels occasionally, but like you, you said at the beginning, Dorigo gets great rainfall, so <laughs> the whole Coffs area gets pretty good rainfall, as long as it's got a bit of an angle to it. And never put panels beneath 10 degrees. That's in the design accreditations. Um, so you get self-cleaning most of the time. But once every couple of years, 
get up, give a bit of a, uh, a, ru- a rub with a, you can put a T-shirt around the end of a, uh, a broom head if you want <laughs> and give a little rub and a bit of a rinse, that's it. Um, so maintenance is pretty low. But do you go back and check that the panels haven't come loose and that the cables haven't been chewed by cockatoos no, and I things like that? I, I don't need to go out for that. Every one of my systems is monitored on Sol Analytics. Right. So, so the secondary feature of Sol Analytics is that I have a fleet and it warns me. So as long as we maintain an internet connection, which is the bane of my existence, keeping internet connections <laughs> going, Wi-Fi's and change of passwords and things like that, 15% of my systems are always damn well offline. But as I keep telling everyone, please talk to me and get your system back online because we are in this internet of things And if we can make sure that we have useful information going to the right people in a secure way, Fronius, by the way, are very, very uh, particular about their mm. cybersecurity. Um, yeah, so if we can if we can get that information, then everyone can get the benefits and it can all be automated. And the algorithms can tell you and warn you if you're underperforming. Um, I even get warnings when they overperform sometimes, but that's okay. I, I don't mind those ones. So do you then sometimes go to a customer or ring them up because this, the monitoring has told you there's something wrong and the customer mm. had no idea? Yeah, so sometimes we'll have something as simple as an electric strike, uh, a lightning strike on the electricity grid can send surges and things through power mm. lines. Mm. Circuit breakers can pop. And if circuit breakers pop, things can go off. So that's why it's really important to maintain an eye on things or to have intelligent monitoring mm. maintaining an eye on things. Um, typically, things don't get damaged very often. Occasionally, I've seen, you know, a panel's been broken by a branch falling down mm. on an array, a mm. bit of vandalism. It's pretty rare. It's mm. pretty rare. Mm. It's, it's usually just... Um, Yeah, some an electrician's come to do a bit of work in your box and he's protected himself by turning off the solar. He's forgot to turn it back on. Things like that. Mm. Mm. And you then surprise the customer because you know more than they do. Yeah, maybe. three days later I say, did you do something with your solar? Can you please check it? <laughs> oh, look, there's a circuit breaker off. Oh, great. Thank you. And uh, away we go. And in the olden days they ring you three months later because now they got a $600 bill mm. they didn't expect. Or six months. Yeah, everyone's busy. Mm. which is why having good monitoring keeps everything working accurately, helps you pick the right retailer every year, and I do buy everyone a five-year subscription for that 380 bucks. So they're paying 78 bucks a year. Use it. It's going to save you three, four hundred dollars a year at least. I've had some customers, seven or eight hundred. One even was over a thousand dollars, and he was on the right retailer, wrong contract. Wow. So one change, one phone call to his current electricity provider. And he switched to a plan where he got a 20 cent feed in tariff that was only on for a short time. Mm. And it was over a thousand dollars difference per year. And it was an elderly gentleman living by himself. He was so happy. Look, uh, checking all the different energy retail plans and trying to compare them and do all of that. I mean, you need a spreadsheet that is as long as your table and, uh, and 15 patience. hours to do the work. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I used to do that. Back in the day before Sol Analytics, I had the spreadsheets and I used to give people Loose advisor, you must do your own mm. research, but I have seen this plan mm. and off you go. And now I just say, look at the software. It compares all the, the best market offers, gives you the top 25. And if you don't like the top one because they're fracking in the Northern Territory, then don't choose them. Go to the next one or mm. the next one. Mm. It shows mm. you how much you'll save. It's brilliant. Yeah, Amazing. Go, Nigel. Love, so, love solar analytics. <laughs> Every one of my systems has it. Yeah, I've got solar analytics on my property and uh, I do actually look at the graph and enjoy it mm. uh, because mm. I do do quite a bit of exporting and I'm getting still a good fit in tariff. So mm. here you go, solar analytics. What you really want is throwing a solar web with the purple for the car and the gold for the self-consumption. Uh, I haven't got an EV yet, so that's uh, yeah. that's on the list. I, I'm still finding what's available in Australia. I'm still looking and I haven't really found the one where I look at the car and go, I like the look, mm. the range is the right one and all that. Mm. And, and I think we're still behind Europe in a lot of the offers and hopefully that changes soon. You've recently gone for an electric vehicle. You've got yeah. solar as well. Do you yeah. have a battery? Uh, so at home, yes. Yes. Um, so why did you finally decide to get an EV? Running costs. I worked out I would save six and a half thousand dollars a year. So I do a fair few Ks with my business, um, you know, 40 something thousand kilometers a year. And I worked out the difference between the two. And so for my business, it's a no brainer. What did you have before? Uh, just a diesel. Uh, well, I also still have it to occasionally t 
tow a very large trailer because <laughs> when you put a, <laughs> a pallet of solar panels with 900 kilos of that and, and then some batteries and inverters and things, you can quickly tow a pretty big trailer. Mm. Um, but generally 90% of my driving I'm using the electric. Um, so, yeah, it, it does add up really quick. Um, the BYD seal, I've been selling BYD batteries for nearly nine years now, and that's something that I really appreciate about them. They, they were a battery manufacturer first before they turned into a vehicle manufacturer, mm. not the other mm. way around. Mm. They make half the iPads in the world. They make a lot of batteries for other electric vehicle manufacturers. Um, they're lithium-ion phosphate, and, and please, when people say lithium-ion, I like to say, well, there's 20 different chemistries out there of lithium ion, of which there are probably three in the market typically used, mainly two, lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, which are inherently unstable. They need careful monitoring and, and, and need to be babied. And that's why when those systems fail, you can see battery fires in cars or in houses, and there has been, hence the recall with, with a certain brand of battery. Um, I don't go near those batteries. I only sell lithium iron phosphate. People call them lithium ion phosphate. It's not. It's iron, like steel, um, because they are all lithium ion batteries. It's about the cathode and the anode inside the, the battery, the positive and negative terminals that make up the battery. Um, lithium iron phosphate lasts 50% longer. It's far more stable. It, it can have a meltdown if you have a major crash, but then BYD built the blade battery. You can literally put a nail through it. It doesn't even have a meltdown. It's the safest battery out there. And with a 82 kilowatt hour battery size in the seal, I get 500 Ks real world range. Wow. Which is phenomenal. So that's the car with, with you know, all your gear in the back and bits and pieces. It's not just you sitting there in an aerodynamic position. <laughs> in to... a wind tunnel. <laughs> Actually, people don't realise they work better around town than they do on the freeway because per kilometre, if you're running at 110 k's an hour, mm. they are pushing a lot of air. Now, a fuel car, an internal combustion engine car, has got so much wasted energy, it doesn't matter. And so we get more efficiency on the freeway. It's the opposite for an EV. We capture 90% of the energy when you brake the car. So if you're doing an average of 60 or 40 k's an hour and stopping and starting, you're actually pushing a lot less air around. You get far more range. Oh, it's backwards. I didn't realise that. No, I didn't realise that either. Mm. Um, the same when I go into the uh, BYD, I press the button twice because I can't hear the engine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird in car parks. You've got to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Children and dogs and things, you've got to be careful. You do. Yeah. Um, They're not used to it. We're, we're all going to get used to them it, mm. more and more and more. I think they should put a little engine noise under the bonnet just so that people can hear the, mm. the EVs. Mm. Yeah, the BYD has that. It's funny enough. It does. I've been looking for the setting and I can't find it. I, I thought it would come preset to be on, but it's mm. not. But you are not kidding me. You're saying they're EVs who deliberately make an engine noise. Oh, not an engine noise. It, it's a. They try to make it palatable <laughs> but it's kind of evolving. but it's kind of a wee is it, it's a wine it? or a, you know um yeah if you look overseas at all the the reviews of the BYD seal all these guys are like gee it's got two sounds to choose from and one sounds like a bloody ice cream van <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then they go to the other one and go all right I'll, I'll live with that but I haven't I haven't heard a peep out of my car yet so yeah I, need I to think they should that. have uh, the Harley Davidson sound they should have <laughs> rock rock and roll they should have uh, one of my ACDs scouts was saying that on the weekend we were talking about EVs and like yeah but it just doesn't sound cool <laughs> I'm like, oh, really? Is it that important? Um, At that I quite bracket. like the sound when you, mm. you put your foot down, you hear this. Zzz, zzz. It's just a, it's a whizzing sound and, and you can hear the road noise and, and you can hear the music and people on the telephone go, are you driving? It's like, mm. yeah. Oh, I couldn't tell. <laughs> it's so quiet. It's, oh. it's, 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 it's beautiful. And, and the, the acceleration is so smooth and so natural. It, it, you know, it's not an accelerator pedal. It's a velocity increase request pedal. Mm, mm. We, we, we have it wrong in our heads and, and electrics just make it so easy to mm, mm. do the right speed you want round a corner or up a hill. You sound to me a bit like a perfectionist. Do you sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and wonder if you left the spanner somewhere or there's unexpected <laughs> issues or yeah. anything like that? Yeah. You just strike me as somebody who really wants to do the right thing. You can thing. ask my wife, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're going in a fetal position here. I do. I do love technology. I, 
I think we are moving from a world that has been a little bit than dark age dark ages. We 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 are moving towards an electric future that is safe and simple. It's it's cheap. It's it's renewable. It's it's robust. It's it's all the things we want. Mm. So you know, I've done a lot of other things um, in my life. I used to work for Paddy Palin. You know, I'm into bushwalking and camping. Of course, being a scout leader, and I do all sorts of outdoor adventure sports. I love rock climbing and things like that. So I suppose I need to be technical for that. You know, I I, I need to when I go canyoning, I need to be tying knots right, and I need to be careful of risks and mitigating risks. So. Yeah, I suppose it's kind of molded me. But 15 years ago, when I started that journey, literally got in my car and towed my camper trailer around Australia on that journey and started living off grid, it was a different world for me. And I fell in love with it. So when I landed in Perth and I was working over there in the solar industry first and then came over back home to the eastern seaboard, something in me just clicked and I woke up each morning motivated. And I guess anyone who wants to be good at something needs to just have a passion for it. That's my one advice. Well, I say to my scouts all the time, look, it doesn't matter what you do. Just do your best and just keep working towards something you want. So, yeah, I, I'm very happy. I'm a pig in mud. Um, so if people choose better vault for their soul on battery... You'll have to put up with me for two to three hours. <laughs> they're not just getting a good system, but they get that extra bit of passion, do they? Yeah, sure. Is that and, and, and when they need that advice and they can rely on the fact that I, I do research every YouTube video about the next battery that's coming out and, and they pop up with, well, what about these these flow batteries, Jeff? What do you think of them? I can, I can wax lyrical for the next 10 minutes about why I think, you know, they're really good in terms of this, but their cost per kilowatt hour and their degradation and their round circle, round, um, round trip performance, you know, they lose 30%, you know. That's by then the wife who was going to make the buying decision probably rolled her eyes and wants to move on. Probably, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> but at least the husband who thought that that video about that battery <laughs> and thought it was really good goes right. Okay, okay. I think he thinks we should get a lithium ion phosphate. <laughs> should we get that one? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> what do you find actually in those couple situations where you have you know a, a couple making a decision all that? Who is actually the one who's making the decision? Oh, a variety, wide variety. Is, it's not always the wife that finally decides, like in the kitchen and the bathroom situation? I swear the other day I reckon one of the kids had a fair say in it. Like it, it, it really, <laughs> it's a wide variety. Um, nah, like society is changing and we're not so separated by these boundaries of uh, of gender and, and, and roles as much as we used to. Um, some some people I've walked in and I've misread it and I thought the guy was more into it mm. and before I knew it, it was the the partner, the wife was saying, okay, well, what about this? And what about the one? Ah, right. You're onto it. You've done a bit of research. <laughs> okay. And and then the guy just goes, yeah, you've got her on, on board, mate. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so uh, what's your lesson there? Don't make any assumptions. Just, just explain it uh, as it is and, uh, yeah. and let the customer make the choice. Look, if I could say what I do badly... I do talk too much. I, I do cover everything under the sun. And a number of times I see people sort of glazing over and I go, oh, dear, doing it again. Um, not everyone wants to know about the politics of, of the WA gas reserve, Jeff. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I probably need to shut up a little bit more and listen a bit more. But, um, but yeah, most people these days are pretty educated. I think I, what I love about having... 85% of all the information the human race has ever had at the, the touch of an iPhone or a mm. smartphone. I, I think that is great. I think what's more important these days is the power of discernment. And what I say mean, this to my scouts as what well. What I mean, what's the power of discernment? Well, you Making decisions? Weeding through things, ah. looking through and relatively comparing and recognising the fraud or recognising the useless and, and, and looking for fallacies, logical fallacies. You know, everyone knows what a red herring is. Did you know there's about 12 other logical fallacies, all with their own little catch names? Recognising where someone's trying to pull the wool over your eyes, mm. um, that is far more powerful than actually being able to find a piece of information now. Because everything is at our fingertips. We've got every media, news source, multinational corporate or industry influencing the information that's out there. 
You know, the advent of social media has become such a divisive force as well as a really amazing tool of connection between people. But to, to actually become a functional and, and productive member of society and, and community member, we need to have the power of discernment. We need to recognise when someone is trying to pull the wool over our eyes. But in some way, it really destroys, especially in regional Australia, the trust that you had. Because every phone call that you get now, you kind of wonder, is that a scammer ready to try and pounce into my account? I mean, I'll give you a good yeah. example. Years ago... We did phone calls and we advised people on solar system by Google Maps. There was a very early days mm. and um, we tried to identify the house. We, she gave the address. We couldn't tell. And uh, we said, oh, you, you got the house with the, a red car in the front, have you? And she goes, oh, yeah, yeah. And there's a really, really big clothesline in the back. And she goes, yes. And we described something else on the house, and she genuinely believed we had some kind of hovercraft spy there, satellite. spy satellite. And she said, how yeah. dare you spying on me? And she hung up. Yeah. So and people are getting very suspicious now because there are damn good scams out there. Yeah. There's not a yeah. link that's coming through I don't want to click on anymore. But doesn't that destroy us as a society in some way of, of trusting your neighbour and what people say? It is a real challenge. Like yesterday I was literally talking about cybersecurity with someone. You know, they literally didn't want to give me their email address mm. until I'd come out, done the quote with them. Then they were going to proceed. Then they give me their email address because they didn't want to be on a database because, as they said, Medicare and these guys and everyone's been hacked. I can fully understand that. Um, I was literally talking to Fronius this morning about the beta testing that we're doing and what's taking a little while for us to get worked out is the security measures um, so that the Fronius system cannot be hacked. Because your solar and battery system is, is you know, it's yours. And Fronius are really attentive to these issues. You know, there's there's some concerns from political people about certain country manufactured inverters and things like that. And I can understand. Um, Huawei was proven to be keeping back doors on their, their IT devices. So we have to be careful. But at the same time, we can't be paranoid. We need to do the research, mm. see where the risk is, assess that risk on the matrix like I would do if I'm going to climb up a cliff and think about all those risks mm. and look at the highest risk with the highest consequence. Mm. Sorry, mm. the highest chance of happening with the highest consequence and really nail those things. But for the things that are really slim, we don't have to be so worried about. We, 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 can, we can do this. Mm. We, we can't take away the information age. The Internet of Things is here already. It's just making sure that we make it robust and intelligent. We bring laws into this country that protect people. Um, and I still think that there's more room to be done in our industry. Mm. Um, but we're getting there. And it's a bright future. I want to bring it back to a very simple question. You walk into my house. I'm thinking about solar and battery. Mm. And I ask a very simple question. Does solar save me money? Absolutely. Well, the question is how much? And how big should you go? Mm. And do you need blackout protection? And all these other things. And so that's a long conversation. And I think anyone who tries to move the conversation to bite-sized five-minute things is a salesperson. And anyone who asks questions and really listens is a consultant and a designer. And what are you? I would hope to be the latter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's what it's all about. I always lock out two, two hours minimum. Sometimes the customer's busy and he only wanted an hour and that's fine. But a lot of the times it'll take two hours because I'll ask about that and I'll ask about this. And what about adding that battery? And when I do get a battery, is there a way to sort of conserve energy during blackouts? Yeah, we put this relay and contactor in and it drops the non-essential circuit breakers mm. so that you don't overload your inverter with too much power and your energy lasts longer through the blackout. You know, we go through those, those questions because in the end it's about confidence and no one gains confidence in 10 minutes. And certainly not over a telephone. You need someone who comes and does the vault rise calculation on the cabling. They need to check the roof. They need to see where the cable is going to go through the roof space. Is it going to be an ugly installation? When you add a battery, there are battery storage standards. Ask any installer who says, oh, I'm going to put this battery here. Well, hold on. Does it back onto a habitable area? You must have fireproof material. As much as, yes, you're, due, you're using lithium iron phosphate mm -hmm. batteries, which don't catch on fire, do they, Jeff? No. But... 
we still have to treat them like every lithium ion battery. And in this state, in this country, there are standards. We must extend 600 mil left, 600 mil light, right, 900 mil above with fireproof material on a wall if it backs on a habitable room. Is it in a garage? You need to put bollards in case of vehicle strike. These are the things that cost a little bit more money, but you do it right and you protect future people with that product. But I find some companies just quote over the phone and look up on Google Earth and yeah. give you a cheap quote and yeah. what's going wrong with that? You get what you pay for. Yeah, exactly. Well, There's it, a lot wrong with that. If you have too high voltage and you blow up your appliances, if you if you have no bollards in the garage and then you sell that house and later on someone moves the cupboard away and now it's fully exposed and some l plater rams the, the battery and destroys a $10,000 battery, you know, there, there's a reason bollards are required under law. What so, about plastic cable ties on the yeah. on the stuff and then they block your mm, gutter four years I've later? I've seen so many bad things up on roofs. Oh, it's it's not good. We we need to do it right. Take the time, do it right. It will last 25 years. That's the beauty of good quality solar now. Mm. Where are we going technology-wise? I mean, are there brand new panels that are going to produce four times as much and inverters? You were that- just talking to me about a new panel that's got another half percent. <laughs> Look, half a percent is half a percent. And in the end, we've come a long way from 15 years ago, a long way. In fact, any array that's been installed in the last five years is pretty good quality and it's probably got a 25-year warranty. The older stuff... It was the first and second generation. We're now at sort of fourth, fifth generation. And things have become a lot more reliable with silicon wafer technology. Everyone wants to talk about heterojunction, perovskite, you know, painting on a layer that goes above the uh, the silicon wafer cells, grabs another wavelength of light. There's the ability to make 40% instead of the 22% that we're getting out of panels these days. But they can't make those things last more than a few weeks let alone 25 years. Mm. They've been working on that for 25, uh, for for 10 years now. Perovskites have been tinkered with. They still haven't got it right. So will it come? Will we get panels where we can fit 30 kilowatts on a standard roof? I guess. I, I You know, <laughs> never discount technology getting better and better and better. Plenty of people have been proven wrong in that respect. But right now, for the price they are, for the longevity that they have, solar is great and easily enough on 90% of people's roofs to do what they need. Batteries, we've certainly got very good quality lifespan, safety. Um, the only main thing is cost. But if we can earn more out of the battery to offset that cost and help pay for it, so, yeah, maybe there is more and more reasons to get a battery these mm. days with these uh, intelligent shifting things we were talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, inverters, yep. Things are certainly settled into a, a pattern where I can't see a lot of change. They're 96% efficient. Mm. I mean, mm. how much more efficient can you get? Mm. 1%. So longevity is the key. And like I said, integration of all things, car charger, home battery, you know, all these things. Running your pool pump at the right time. Absolutely. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Timing things. So hence using the, the, the catch. Sorry, they used to call it a catch solar relay. Now it's called the... Wasn't it Catcher Power or something? Catch Power is the name of the, the, the manufacturer, but the Catch Control is Ooh. the name of the little catch control. small two-pole relay, mm. the intelligent. Um, and, yeah, you can do stuff through Amber with that soon as well. They're working on that. So I was just talking to Tim from Amber Electric yesterday all about this. Mm. Um, mm. So there's some great things. And, and software as a service, in other words, people who create things that do intelligent things out there in the cloud are really making lives better and taking away the stranglehold that the uh, fossil fuel companies have on our energy distribution networks. You know, we, we we can easily supply it all with renewables now. It's just a question of how quickly we can transition away from people who've got a very, very strong control over our political and economic systems. Um, it's the happening. biggest dinner plates are sold still to the oil companies when it comes to fundraisers at political parties. <laughs> look at the look at the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been given to fossil fuels with tax rebates. Mm. Just flat out donations towards their facilities so that they can ship gas to the coast and put it on a boat and take it to another country. Mm. Why are we paying? Why are we subsidizing that as a country? It's insanity. They've got plenty enough money, 
But that's the problem. They've got enough money to influence the people who make the decisions. It's it's this. <laughs> someone said to me the other day that the the biggest problem with this, the renewable energy industry it doesn't have lobby groups. They do, but uh, we're the ones with the fig leaf, and the other ones. Yeah, the, yeah sorry. The big we, hammer. We have a lobby group <laughs> of people who want to do the right thing, but we don't have a lobby group with such a big wallet that they can make any politician do anything. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I thought in Australia politics are very honest, and they mm. do it all for the right reasons. Mm. Yeah, our political system isn't broken at all. I have a big problem with three years between federal elections because they can never have the courage to make big decisions because by mm. the time they want to scratch themselves for a big decision, they're back up for a new election. Yeah, yeah, and look, appeasing certain sides of the media um, to to never step too far in one direction would be labelled, you know, ultra greeny. Mm. What for, for, you know, it, something as simple as just removing um, negative gearing on housing to try and ease the housing crisis. <laughs> Look, I don't have a problem with negative gearing if you leave it to one or two houses. Yeah. It's, I think it's the it's people the, who've got five, tenth. seven or ten yeah. where I really yeah. do feel you should kind of look into that a little bit and yeah. I find the politicians very strange they haven't even got the balls for that. No. Mm. Oh, anyway. Well. Anyway, we yeah. can't change everything. Yes, we, can yes. work, we can work out the energy yeah. stuff, though. Yeah. Coffs is a very green area. How do you handle shade? What do you do in those cases? Well, shading isn't so much of an issue. Um, I've done a lot of investigation into microinverters, DC optimizers. I don't tend to sell them. Um, I've seen, and, and the statistics are correct, that in a heavily shaded situation, a solar panel will produce, you know, 17, 18% more energy with a micro mm. op inverter or DC optimizer. Um, why are you putting a panel in a really heavily shaded situation? I'm sorry, I don't do that. Um, partially shaded situations, maybe I'm missing out on 2 or 3%. But for the benefits of a string inverter, Fronius string inverters, um, and the ability to be able to add a battery simply to have one inverter on one wall that's cool, that it's accessible, that we can get to and program and do things or attach a battery is far better than converting the DC to AC up on the roof and then bringing it down and converting it back to DC to try and play with the battery and then how do you make them turn off when the grid blacks out and all the complex issues. Um, and also, if I've got 20 small power conversion electronic devices mm. up on the roof, versus one solid one on the wall and they all have a 1% failure rate or 0.1% failure rate, it's 20 times worse to have 20 of them. Mm. So for me as a business, I find that to be a struggle. I want to go back to a handful of customers because every inverter will have a failure. There is an inverter out there that hasn't had a failure. The question is how much? And then if that is an acceptable level, and I, I would say 95% of inverters don't, have an acceptable level. But isn't it also important with the manufacturer that if you do have a failure, that they back you and they're right mm. behind you so yeah. that the switchover can done, be done very quickly? Yeah. So uh, I'm a Fronius um, service agent. Service agent. I, I, have, um, I have the ability to have parts in stock and I keep parts for my major inverters in stock. And so if there's an issue and we determine that fault quickly over the monitoring that is an issue that I need to change a part over, we can send a guy out, he can change the part, go, it's fixed. I then send the part back to them and they send me another replacement part to put back my stock. So it's quick and it's painless um, and they'll also pay me $150 to go and do that. Mm. So now my boy's time is is um, Covered. taken care of. Mm. Um, but still, it, I, I would rather have one twentieth of the issues. Mm. And, and that's the key thing here. I don't want someone always having to go out and fix things because there's one little piece up on a roof that's broken. I'd rather have one solid thing on the wall with the same failure rate percentage-wise, but there's one twentieth of the issues. Okay, that makes sense. If I'm now describing better vault, I've used you and I want to entice my neighbour to have a look at solar, how would I describe better vault in a couple of quick dot points? No, look, local, um, accredited designer and installers who know their work, um, been around in the area a long time. I've been working with Tom and Will for uh, 12 and a half years. The, um, who is Tom and Will? Oh, my, my head electrician and his brother, mm. and then I've got Morgan and Dave as well. 
Um, so we're only a small outfit, but it's a small country town and, and that's fine. We're, um, we're a good size. Um, yeah, look, we do everything from we're, we're right now we've just started on a 116 kilowatt system on Bishop Druitt College and we've got uh, another couple hundred kilowatts and another few schools coming potentially when a grant comes through potentially um, all the way down to the small off-grid system for that guy down at Bundadjan at, um, which is a, a community down on the headland on the beach there, um, which I just flew over this morning. And uh, it's, a, it's a gorgeous area. And, and look, that's a little off-grid system for him and he's just running lights and a fridge and, um, and his laptop. Um, off-grid, on-grid, hybrid, commercial, electric cars. We, we know our stuff and I guess that's, that's the key thing. Um, and there are other good people around the area too. I'm not going to say that I'm the only one. I really like our local area and I, I have a good relationship with a lot of other solar companies. I've got good friends. Um, so, yeah, do your research. Find someone local. Talk to them. Do your research online but also just talk to them. Sit down and go through it and ask, have you got an accreditation for this design work or are you going to do a volt rise calculation? Um, I've got a friend who's building a house, wants to go off grid. Should he? Uh, there's a grid connection there. No, no, don't. No, stay on the grid. Go a hybrid maybe but don't go off grid. Mm. Stay on the grid. Trust me, you'll you'll financially and environmentally be much better off. Everyone will be. Mm. We can all play in this energy future together. Um, so having someone who knows all that and can paint the picture, um, yeah. That's but but you must have had a customer once who was a bit of the cranky nature, and you did get a complaint. I mean, you must have had complaints and stuff. Yeah, yeah I've had like one or two. E even unreasonable people or whatever. Well, that's. Really, the only ones. Oh, well, of course, I would say that <laughs> that they were unreasonable. Um, <laughs> yeah. well, I'm making a complaint about you calling yeah, me unreasonable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you be careful about what you say. Um, but I mean, how do you handle? Look, them? some people have very high expectations, and they may have the wrong idea. And so, all you can do is say, "Look, I'm sorry. I will do whatever I can to rectify the situation. Please hang in there with me. Please be patient. Mm. Have I heard you out? Repeat back to them." their concern. Mm. The first mm. thing I ever learned when I started doing customer service, uh, Woolworths when I was a young kid, um, if when I worked on the service <laughs> centre, uh, the, the sorry, the, the... When Woolworths was still loved. Well, yeah, yeah, I suppose it's come a long way in 30 years. Um, but, yeah, when I, the first thing you do is you actually try and understand what the issue is. Don't try and railroad someone down a path. But I told you. Yeah, okay. Um, what did you hear? Okay. All right. So, look, I thought I said this, but you've obviously heard that and I apologise for that. You know, you, you can only really take something to the best possible situation and then nip it in the bud, spend the money on what needs to be fixed and done and then say, I hope that's been okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. And then, okay, fine. Moving on. Um, you know, we don't need to dwell on this. We're going to do our best to, to rectify mm. the situation. Away we go. That's, that's all you can do. Well, what happened if, let's say, I know you do a lot of the sales yourself, but let's say if you actually misread the switchboard and it was two-phase, but you thought it was three-phase. Oh, there, I wear that. And there's extra costs. I wear that, yeah. And that's the thing. I, I will always do the right job and put the right bits in. If I've read it wrong, I just go, all right, well, there goes half my profit. Okay, so what? So be it. Yep, that's how You're it's not trying be. to wiggle yourself out, blame the no. customer and get extra money? No, no, no. If they've changed something, and I always put things down in, in mm. contracts and on mm. paperwork mm. to mm. say exactly what we're doing, mm. because some people might try it on. You never know. You, th you just think, oh, look, you've changed this. So how about I meet you halfway here and let's do that. And that way I don't lose, but they don't lose either. Mm. It's always got to find that win-win. That's very important because your name is everything in a small town. Mm. Okay. So solar sharks, no survival in coughs. Actually, I'm, I must say I'm pretty happy. I think it's far more prevalent in the major cities. Right. I really do. I'm another reason why I love working where I love. Mm. And work. Working where I live. <laughs> <laughs> you love working where you love. Uh, love and live. I don't think your wife wants us to go into that part <laughs> with the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I do love that about it. It's, it is a small town and so it's the type of community I want. Mm, mm. Mm. Let's just put our future cap on mm -hmm. and have a look at – Solar, smart home, EV, going fast forward three, four, five, ten years. Mm -hmm. You do a lot of research. Mm. Where do you think we're going to be in the five to ten year period with the whole energy field? 
Simple. Um, ubiquitous, cheap, reliable, resilient, just everywhere. There'll so be you, no question. There'll be <laughs> all those people who say, well, I'm not going to buy an electric car these days ago. You, <laughs> you're going to be eating those words in 10 years, man. <laughs> because there's nothing else on the market, oh, is look, it? It's a given now. We've, we've crossed parity mm. already. So in 10 years, it's going to be obscenely cheap. And, and cost of fossil fuels is only going up. So it's only going to go one way. So, yeah, yeah, if you really love the vroom, okay, maybe I can't help you there. Maybe I can with some, <laughs> some audio file you download into the damn car. But if you love the vibration and the, and the stink and the particles and everything coming out of that tailpipe, I can't help you. But 99% of people are going to be there. So if we're, if we're going to solve our problems as a country, whether that's a reliable grid, a stable grid, a cheap grid for everybody, mm. and 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 I'm talking about parity for everybody. People who live in the cities don't have access to lots of rooftop space if they're in unit blocks and all those things. If we're going to give everyone a, an equal stab at this, a fair go, as our politicians like to say sometimes, then we need to think about the big picture. There are current market reforms that are going a long way to this. We need to keep going. It It's only going to be harder and worse for us if we delay and we allow those powerful interests to obfuscate and change and create doubt. Just like the smoking industry did back in the 70s, they delayed the transition and still we have people who, who smoke. But they even in terms of energy, there's no upside whatsoever mm. to I'm, using fossil fuels. I mean, the smoking industry came now through the back door again with the vaping. Back know, they are. I know. And that's a highly technical way of delivering any type of drug into the lung of any age person, mm. which is shocking. It's insidious. And we can see that in the fossil fuel industry with the promoting of, or I should say the demoting of um, electric vehicles. Currently, right now, there's an assault on the EV industry. You look at Toyota. I've owned two Toyota Prados and I love those cars. Mm. Um, so I'm not a... Uh, a troglodyte or a, <laughs> an anti-Toyota person, I I really do respect high-quality engineering. But Toyota really delayed. They only just released the pricing for their brand-new full electric car, the first one for them to enter the market. In the marketing guard that they put out at the same time, they said, oh, we're really making this transition too quick. They were, they were downplaying EVs in the marketing material for the electric car that they first produced the BZ4X. And you've only got to think about the ownership of, of Toyota and what other assets they own. These car companies have been built up over many decades and decades to become reliant and, and, and you know, symbiotic with each other in terms of fossil fuels and the cars that burn them. So do I get angry and rail against Toyota for being such idiots for not seeing this obvious thing that's happening right now as they get decimated on the market value and everything. Um, that the Tesla is worth more than the next top five major electric, uh, major car manufacturers in the world combined mm. on the market value. So, so they're getting decimated. So a lot of them are shifting, but Toyota's dragging their heels. And I feel sorry for the Japanese society because 30% of their entire economy revolves around the automotive industry. And so they, and, and Toyota sits at the head of the board of the Automotive Association in, in Japan. They were offered $678 million grant from the Japanese government to hurry up on the EV side. They declined it. That says something about Toyota and where their financial interests sit. So will I one day buy a, uh, a, a electric four-wheel drive from Toyota? Most probably because they'll eventually have to get on board. But I feel sorry for them because so many industries are shackled to this existing monetary behemoth and it's the largest shift of financial capital from one industry to another since the Industrial Revolution. The human race is going through the biggest shift ever right now. And it's going away from fossil fuels and into much more diverse hands. Lots of mums and dads who want to just put solar on their roof for their house and reduce their reliance on the grid. 
that's going to help all of us except the shareholders of Toyota and and the like. I do have one concern, Bart, because German background, you know, same thing with Germany and uh, the car industry. And I look at how much the whole of Germany and the exports depend on the BMWs, the Mercedes, the VWs, yeah. brands, Audi, etc. And there's a certain arrogance there where we thought, well, the Chinese can never build a car like us. And now there is the Aura at a price point, the MG at a price point, the BYD at a price point, that for the German car you get the two doors and the two tyres. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. so how is? But I think China must be subsidised or something a bit like with solar panels, because I think they mm. recognise renewables is the future. So the government has really helped uh, to dominate the world, and yeah. so the world yeah. actually depends now more and more on China to get the right solutions. Yeah, the CCP really looked forward. They didn't have that three, four year election term cycle mm. in their brain, so. They looked forward and went, wow, we can really see a way to corner resources, you know, mm. cobalt and manganese and all that sort of stuff. That's why I like lithium ion phosphate as well. It's a, it's also a less reliant on international stuff. And, and Australia is now the largest lithium producer in the world. Mm. Mm. So we've really ramped up and we have a major opportunity. Yeah, but we just dig it up and send it out. I know, we never, we I never know. do more with it. So oh, my point is I like what Twiggy Forrest is doing. He's trying to at least get some secondary refining, refining of iron ore and things like that. Come on, guys, we can easily do this. Yeah, but the government is still kind of really mm. business as usual. Look, they're helping out. There's Renaissance and the Hunter. They're starting to, you know, they're still not manufacturing all their own cells, but they're on the way to. And, mm. and when I can get an Australian battery, absolutely I'm gonna have it on offer. Um, you know, you always support those things that can be supplied locally, I think, if it's good quality. But getting back to boxes. China's total influence over yeah, the industry. Look, it's hard to beat them. It really is. Um, what we have to do is copy them. We have to we have to join the, the fight. We have to stop playing to the, the, the fiddle of the fossil fuel industry, which is just delaying and obfuscating and, and creating a, a situation where they will keep making the billions of dollars that they make. You know that just with the Ukraine war in the 22-23 tax year, Mm. the fossil fuel companies worldwide made an extra quarter of a trillion dollars profit. That's extra profit, not the normal profits they make. They already make a lot of money. They made an extra $250 billion of profit because of Putin and the Ukraine. Because the overall energy prices have risen and uh, their costs have stayed the same. Yep. They only had to go up 20%. That's how much they made. So, you know, when you've got that much money, when your wallet's that big, how can all those investors and those boards and and those decision makers, CEOs of those companies, not do everything they can to with – withhold and and delay a transformation that's going to decimate their... Well, you know what they're doing. They're all moving to renewables and batteries. They're all investing in massive batteries and they're all investing in wind and solar. So, you know, they just want to delay it as long as they can. Once they know that they've lost the gamble, then they'll just, you know, get on board and play with renewables anyway. The The point for me is... I like giving people the autonomy and the power in their hands. If they can get a battery at home and they can earn an extra $2,000 a year on top of their normal savings Mm, from a solar mm, system mm. to stabilise the grid and make all these cool things happen in our world, instead of a very large battery owned by an offshore multinational company making the billions of dollars, well, aren't we providing more money for our local economies Mm. so that people can then spend that money on getting something local getting that service or, or support, employing locally, giving our kids jobs, you know, it revs up the local economy like you wouldn't believe. If the five of us in my company were doing other things, what would we be doing, you know? We can make more employment in renewable local, you know, mm. providers. Mm. Mm. We can do far more than ever we'll, we'll get out of a, a multinational throwing us scraps on their big, you know, Pilbara gas project or whatever it may be. You look at the cost on the economy and on the environment and it's a negative win with them. It's a win-win-win with us. So you're maybe more of a believer to actually put solar on literally every roof and make towns 
basically be power stations instead of even running wind and renewable far, far away and then run the cables all the way through the countryside? Look, I think we're still going to have to do upgrades of infrastructure. There's probably uh, tens or even a hundred and something billion dollars worth of investment that needs to be made there. Mm. We are going to have to move the energy around more because mm. renewables are intermittent. We can't escape that. Um, every time people have been consulted properly and given fair compensation for the use of their land, they're fine whether it's wind turbines or power lines coming through their property, as long as they're compensated. It's where we scrimp and we, we kind of screw the farmers that I really don't like. You know, give them fair compensation. Give them $10,000 a year for every turbine that sits, you mm. know, they're, mm. they're very happy when that happens. Mm. You mm. know, they have a passive income that they are very happy to let roll in and so you think hear a lot the of... money whirring away. Mm. <laughs> so you think a lot of the uh, issues come when they uh... – uh, looking at the compensation for those power mm. lines and the companies who built them yeah. are actually putting a rip-off deal well, on the table. And and or they're being railroaded so mm. they don't ha feel like they're actually having a discussion. It's just take it or leave it sort of mm. attitude mm. and we're going to do it anyway regardless. That's not okay. And lastly, it's been politicised. So in this wonderfully polarised, divisive world where everything's about clicks and everything's about rage and engaging people on the worst possible human instinct, we are letting the fossil fuel companies take us for a ride because they've got hundreds of billions of dollars of profit, pure profit, sitting in their pocket. It doesn't take more than a few tens of millions here and there to warp a conversation. So... Do I listen to these anti-renewables rallies? <laughs> I thought we're going for nuclear now. <laughs> oh, it's a hundred times more expensive. It's insane. Have you looked at the, the, the cost blowouts alone are in the 400 to 500% range from what they originally say they're going to I cost. love nuclear it's because <laughs> if there's something goes wrong, we're going to have a new tourist attraction. Mm. We can actually ship people in in, in hazmat suits mm. and the they can go around. The of Western Sydney. I've, I've seen people visiting <laughs> Chernobyl now. It's a tourist attraction. Yeah. We want yeah, nuclear here. Years, but yeah. <laughs> oh, look, it's, it's, it's sad that we can get so diverted, so easily diverted because someone owns 70% of the newspapers in the country and they can say whatever they like and there's no – whenever it's about politics, you can say any lie because, hey, it's politics. And it's a shame that we've let it slide that much. Um, and one thing that always gets me about nuclear is this. We have the building of the plant, the refining of the ore, and we, we create the nuclear power plant. It runs for a certain amount of time. There's nuclear waste and then the disposal of all the materials. What do you do? Just, just bury it in a sarcophagus like Chernobyl? And, oh, whoops, you know, that's oh, you can't use that for 50,000 years. I remember seeing a documentary on just the storage We put it to waste. South Australia because it's the smallest state. They don't have as many votes. <laughs> and and so we, we all, not in my backyard, you know, nimby it. And, okay, so we got to dig these tunnels underground and then the cost of maintaining the storage facility can't even be calculated. It's much it, cheaper than the free power of the sun. It oh, must be. Yeah. I read it in an article in one of the papers. <laughs> Thanks, right. Rupert. Uh, well, you say you're not on the board, <laughs> but we all know. Um, <laughs> look, <laughs> Rupert sits on the board of Engie, in one of the largest fossil fuel companies. Um, you know, like you've only got to look at follow the money, follow the money, and I don't get angry at them. I just get disillusioned at how much people who should be discerning, look at the information and go, that's a valid point. Those electric cars, what do you do when the battery's failed? Um, no, the battery's going to last the life of the car. And oh, you recycle um, them. They're heavier, so they're going to break car parks. Um, <laughs> do you know how many SUVs and other things are out there? Um, they're way heavier. <laughs> you know, there's always another reason, and that's because it's become ideological. It's become an engagement of fear and rage and people have, you know, issues in their life and it mm. lets them get something off their chest and then they're part of a, a, a team that's anti some other team and there's the polarised, fractured society that does no one any good. Now, do the research. Anyone who's got the time and energy and, and discernment can do the research and see that we're on mm. a great path. So, you know, kudos to us for being at the forefront of this too in Australia. Mm. Mm. We're very, very lucky. 
amazing resources of renewables, but also we're getting to this cutting edge technology first. Mm. We can ship that off and we can be manufacturers. I do agree that we need a bit more nudging on the political forces to, to get more made in this country. Look, I mean, I really just came to have a quick chat about solar installations, but we got <laughs> uh, got into quite a bit of politics and all that. And get any philosophy. Should we go there? Well, no, 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 no we no. didn't go philosophies, no. but uh, you did certainly, did. Uh, you know, Give us a give us a picture about the level of passion. Hmm. Um, do th a couple of things I do want to say to people in general. You don't actually realise how lucky you are in Australia at the cost of what renewables come here. Mm. My si lovely sister in Germany, bit of fear with Russia and the gas and all that, so they want to be more independent. She decided to get an eight and a half kilowatt system and a six kilowatt battery. Okay, I don't know what uh, the six kilowatt hour battery was really going to do for them, but uh, they were believing that that's the right thing for them. The total cost in Australian dollar for that system installed right now in the middle when there's a boom of installs because everybody wants it and everybody's fearful of Russia in the next winter mm. was $60,000. Wow. Good margins for somebody. Similar to America, right? Eh? Yeah. America's also. So, so Australia, you would possibly pay around the 20 grand or even a bit less for such a system, depending on the quality of the various components. Fronius and BYD would be about 21, 22 with all the fancy yeah, bits yeah, in the box yeah. for the so, switching. So yeah. 60 versus 20. So mm. my point to you is simply you actually can buy it with a very good payback period that in a few years you get your bucks back mm. and you're going to be in the plus. Wow. I don't think my sister is ever going to get her money back, but, you know, I know Sola and I love her dearly, so I wasn't actually doing the math for her uh, because she would have possibly cried. So don't trust everything that sales guys tell you when it comes to Sola. Do your own research and pick a local company. And Jeff, uh, really, I had a better vault experience here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, really, I love their passion and... Uh, I think if somebody picks you as an installer, they better put uh, one and a half hours aside and uh, <laughs> maybe two and, and are willing to learn <laughs> and but get the good result out of it at the end too. Absolutely. So thanks yeah. again for turning up and uh, we we'll hopefully see you soon again. Thank you, Marcus. Cheers. Great. Cheers. Want more Energy Answered? Visit yourenergyanswers.com for quality energy products, tools and calculators and find your quality local installers. Please support the channel by liking the video, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell and check out all our other videos. You're still here? I'll see you next time. Bye.